Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. As of tomorrow, if you happen to be watching this video on the day that it goes live, we're going to be two weeks away from the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla, which will be taking place on the 6th of May 2023. Today, I want to take a look at the invitation that has been produced and sent out for this event. I do already have a few videos on the use of heraldry, symbols and motifs by members of the nobility and monarchy from times past, which I will of course be leaving linked. But I think that this coronation invitation, which rhymes in a rather pleasant way, can be explored in similar, if not the same way. So let's hop right in without further ado and take a look at it. This invitation was designed by heraldic artist and manuscript illuminator Andrew Jameson, who is a member or brother of the Art Workers Guild. King Charles himself was made an honorary member of this very guild in 1989. The original artwork for this invitation was produced using a combination of watercolour and gouache which refers to pigments that are mixed and thickened with a gum-like substance that generates opacity when those colours are laid down on the paper. The official website of the British Royal Family explains that this design has now been printed onto recycled card to which gold foil detailing has been added. More than 2,000 of these invitations have now been issued. If I'm remembering correctly, I think that my first question when I saw this invitation was, is there a formula for the way that coronation invitations are supposed to look? Does this one look much like the ones that have come before it? Well, very helpfully, reporters from a variety of publications clearly had a similar thought or question to the one that I had. And helpfully, that then led them to collect previous versions of the coronation invitations altogether for us to be able to have a look at them in the one place. Country Living pulled together the last eight coronation invitations, beginning with King George IV's in 1820 and running all the way through to the one from this year. I will, of course, be linking that article in my description box just in case you would like to check it out for yourselves. In the meantime, I will be briefly touching on and showing the coronation invitations that were sent out for the coronations that took place during the 20th century. First up, we have this from 1902, which is now held in the collection of the British Museum. This is the invitation for the coronation of Queen Victoria's son, King Edward VII, and his wife and queen consort, Queen Alexandra which took place at Westminster Abbey on the 26th of June. The design for this invitation was created by George William Eve. The achievements of arms of the King and the Queen sit in the top left and top right corners respectively as we look at this invitation. We can also see that their initials feature above the achievements of arms in each case. A border of crowns interspersed with national symbols that link to the British Empire and its dominions, frames the text. We have the Rose for England, Thistle for Scotland, Shamrock for Ireland, Lotus for India, Maple Leaf for Canada, King Protea for South Africa, and the Five Stars of the Southern Cross for Australia. The text reads as follows. By command of the King, the Earl Marshal is directed to invite, and then a space is left blank for the invitee's name to be added, presumably in a beautiful calligraphy, to be present at the Abbey Church of Westminster on the 26th day of June 1902. It is then signed by Norfolk, Earl Marshal. The coronation of Edward and Alexandra's son, George, occurred on the 22nd of June 1911. 
King George V was crowned alongside his wife, Queen Mary. Once again, we can see that we have those initialed achievements of arms on the right and left hand sides, respectively. Between these devices, an allegorical figure holds the sovereign's orb and scepter. The symbols at the bottom of this invitation connect to the British Empire and its dominions, including New Zealand, Aotearoa, Canada, England, Scotland and Ireland, India, Australia and South Africa. Once again, we can see this is signed Norfolk, Earl Marshall. To invite people to the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth on the 12th of May 1937, following the abdication of King Edward VIII, Norfolk Earl Marshall was once again called upon. Working around through the arms, emblems and shields from the top left corner we have represented here, His Majesty the King. Then we have England, Scotland, Her Majesty the Queen, Wales, India, Australia, South Africa. In the middle, we see the Royal Cipher. Then there is New Zealand, Aotearoa, Canada, the Union itself, and Ireland. The shields are surrounded by the official plants of the nations that made up the relatively newly founded dominions of the British Commonwealth of Nations, in addition to the plant of the still extant Empire of India and the United Kingdom itself. For Queen Elizabeth II's coronation on the 2nd of June 1953, we can see that Her Majesty's arms have been placed at the top of a floral border. This border incorporates the flowers and plants that connect to the nations which made up the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth at that time. Notice how we are no longer using the term empire or dominions. These flowers and plants are wrapped around the sovereign's two scepters. On the left hand side, we see the scepter with the dove, which is also known as the rod of equity and mercy. It symbolises the Holy Ghost, and thus it links to the monarch's spiritual role. On the right, we have the scepter known as the scepter with the cross. That cross sits on the top of an orb, which is itself placed on the top of a frame that holds the diamond known as Cullinan I. More coronation regalia sits at the bottom of this invitation. We have St Edward's crown, the crown used in the coronation. We have the orb. We have the ampulla and coronation spoon. The former is used to contain the sacred oil for the coronation, while the latter is used to anoint the monarch with it. We also see the jewelled sword of offering and one of the swords of spiritual justice, temporal justice or mercy. Norfolk Earl Marshall is still about his business, as he is in this invitation too. So I suppose we should start by looking at who or what an Earl Marshall is. The role of Earl Marshall is a hereditary one which an unbroken line of Howard Dukes of Norfolk have held since the time of the reign of King Charles II. Edward Fitzalan Howard is the current incumbent of both the title and this role. The website for the College of Arms explains that, quote, The Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, is one of the two great officers of state, and the office is hereditary in his family. He has particular powers of supervision over the heralds and the College of Arms, which is the body that regulates heraldry. The arrangement of state funerals and the monarch's coronation in Westminster Abbey fall under the jurisdiction of the Earl Marshal, and the heralds have a role in their organisation. For example, ensuring that the appropriate regalia is being worn by all attendees who are expected to wear it, and that the proper order of precedence is being observed during these great and significant events are things that would fall under the Earl Marshal's purview. Certainly, any instructions that are being issued in this regard will bear his name and title. At the top left corner of this invitation, we see the King's Arms. 
the heroic supporters are the Lion of England and the Unicorn of Scotland. In mythology, the unicorn is a symbol of purity and innocence. But the tales also told of this beast's fierce, violent independence. They were, we are told, almost impossible to capture or control. Indeed, only a truly worthy individual, someone who had the requisite morality and purity of their own, could ever hope to do so. The chained coronet that sits around this unicorn's neck, known as the unicorn being gorged, has been read as a way of showing that the kings of Scots had these attributes, that they were worthy in just such a way. Unicorns were also the sworn enemy of lions, as they both apparently fought to be known as the king of the beasts. Thus, these were perhaps fitting emblems for the almost continuously warring nations of England and Scotland. However, with the Union of the Crowns of 1603, these once warring kingdoms were now both being ruled by the same person, James VI and I. From this point, as a sign of the newfound unity between these realms, the lion and the unicorn were both employed to support the royal arms. Between them is the shield, featuring the three lions passant gardant, referring to how they're standing, on that red field. They are for England. We also have the red lion rampant on a yellow field within a double royal treasure, Flory Counterflory, which refers to the way the frame around it looks. This is for Scotland. And also on the azure, a harp or stringed argent, meaning a gold harp with silver strings that is placed on a blue background. This is for Ireland. The monarch's crown sits on top of the shield, which is itself enclosed by the garter. This garter bears that medieval French motto, which belongs to the order of the garter. Oni soit qui mal y pense. There is some debate about the meaning and significance of this motto, but it is said to translate to, quote, shame on him who thinks evil of it. I do have a video about the Order of the Garter that I will be leaving linked. At the bottom, we have the motto, Dieu est mon droit, God and my right. This references the concept of there being both a divine right and blood claim to the throne. The arms on the right-hand side at the top of this invitation are, as we can see, slightly different. Firstly, the motto has been removed. The shield at the centre has been impaled with arms that are inspired by those of Her Majesty's father, Major Bruce Shand. The supporting beast on the left-hand side has also been changed to include the blue boar. This boar that has been gorged with a royal coronet connects to the crest on her father's achievement of arms. The garter encloses this impaled shield too. This is following Her Majesty's installation as a royal lady of the Order of the Garter in 2022. In the middle of the top of the border is an ornate letter C, referencing both Charles and Camilla. A robin sits on the top and a wren sits within. And perhaps this is a reference to the saying, quote, the robin and the wren are God's cock and hen, as though the wren were the female of the robin, that together they are a natural pairing. Some traditions hold both of these birds to be sacred. There is even a belief that a terrible fate might befall any person who harms either one of them. Alternatively, they might have been placed here due to their connection with the summer and the winter. The wren connects with the winter, while the robin represents the warmth and rebirth of the sun in summer. Curving within this sea is the lily of the valley. This is a popular choice in the bouquets of royal brides. It symbolises purity, love, a return to happiness and also good luck. Additionally, it is a wildflower that can be found in various locations around the United Kingdom. This plant flourishes in particular in the month of May, which is, of course, when this coronation is occurring. Indeed, the border of this invitation has been described as a wildflower meadow in bloom. We see hawthorn, which symbolises hope and love. 
cornflowers for fidelity and love, wild strawberries signifying perfect righteousness and love, dog roses for love and pleasure, bluebells for humility, constancy, gratitude and, you guessed it, everlasting love. There are primroses, which connect to ideas of renewal and optimism, and wild pansies, which signify free thinking and thoughtfulness and or consideration. On top of this, pansy flowers have also been linked to feelings of remembrance and nostalgia. In this vein, we also find on the invitation a sprig of rosemary, which, as Ophelia reminds us in the play Hamlet, is, quote, for remembrance. And it is in particular for the remembrance of lost loved ones. The repeating pattern of there being clusters of three flower heads, in some cases including buds, is a reference to the king being the third monarch of his name. The border also features the Rose of England, Thistle of Scotland, Daffodil of Wales and Shamrock of Ireland. In the two bottom corners, we can see that these flowers appear to be gathered, that they appear to sprout from one single shared stem. They also cluster around the foliate head in the centre at the bottom. This is known as a green man, and this figure is also crowned and shaped out of oak, ivy and hawthorn. Now, I have noticed that there has been a lot of discourse about the green man's significance and origins in the last few days and weeks. We do not have a set origin point in terms of a date, tradition or significance for this symbol, motif or image. It has variously been presented as a pagan symbol and or a folklore character, possibly a trickster, and or a symbol of seasonal renewal, rebirth, even resurrection and so on. Indeed, carvings of green men dating from the medieval period onwards can be found in churches throughout Europe. There is even a green man at the top of the choir screen in Westminster Abbey, which is of course where this coronation will be taking place. The green man is a powerful environmental symbol as well. Within the border, the heraldic beasts that feature in the achievements of arms are shown to be mingling with a bee which I think is a fairly well-known symbol for industriousness. Also featured is a ladybug, symbolic of protection. As you may or may not know, ladybugs do protect plants from pests such as aphids. There is also a butterfly, which of course connects to ideas of transformation, rebirth and or new beginnings. There is here, I think, some very clear and consistent messaging about the things that matter to this monarch, and likely, presumably, to his consort too. For example, King Charles's environmentalism is, I think, by now pretty well known. But are we also being promised things here too? A new beginning, transformation, hard work, loyalty, free thinking, humility, and certainly love to name just a few. There is, I think, a nod to tradition, to memory here, but I can see that that is being combined with an apparent mission statement for a brand new start. In terms of content, I can see that this invitation certainly does contain echoes of what has come before. However, where it diverges, for me at least, is in its vibrancy. In this invitation, we're also seeing a mission statement that is personal in addition to being national and monarchical. Here we see an evocative riot of colour that sends out a message to the viewer, and it's doing so, I believe, in a way that coronation invitations that have come before it never managed to do. Well, except perhaps for one bespoke and highly personalised example. When Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was crowned, On the 2nd of June, 1953, her eldest son, the current King Charles, was just four years old. In the run-up to his mother's coronation, he received this personalised invitation for the event. The heraldic lion is surrounded by English roses 
Welsh daffodils and Irish shamrocks. The unicorn with Scottish thistles, Welsh daffodils and Irish shamrocks. Guardsmen in their ceremonial dress are marching around this scene playing their instruments. They are also shown supporting the Royal Arms at the top of this invitation, from which two Union flags stretch out, to a leafy tree on the one side and to a classical column on the other. I'm going to be very interested to read your thoughts, but I can't help but connect the contemporary invitation to this one from 1953. For me, there's a clear connection in terms of how these two invitations feel, in terms of their aesthetic, so much so that I cannot shake the following notion. And just to be clear, this is all imagined. This is my personal fantasy, if you will. I am speculating. I absolutely wasn't in any of the meetings between Andrew Jameson, his team, the palace and King Charles. I don't know what was said what was decided and how we got to the 2023 coronation invitation design. But part of me cannot shake the idea that when King Charles was asked what his invitation should look like, at least part of his mind, perhaps a subconscious part, went all the way back to the personal invitation that he received from his own mother. That some part of him decided that that was how it should feel. But maybe I'm just a romantic. But what do you think of the coronation invitation in 2023? What about the invitations that have come before this one? I wonder if anyone has any plans for the coronation. And if you do, maybe you'd like to share them with us all in the comment section. Because as always, I am looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. Or you can come and find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of them so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, why not share it with your friends? In fact, if you like my channel more generally, please do tell some pals about it and that way you will have some people to talk about history with in real life too. You can let me know that you liked this video by hitting the thumbs up and by also interacting in the comments, even if you're just dropping an emoji or as we started to call them, a social glyph. As we're talking about coronation, maybe you'd like to pop a crown down there or a tiara, the choice is yours. Please do subscribe to the channel. If you think you're subscribed, now's a perfect time to check. Make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And while you are there checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, allegedly, YouTube will tell you both when I've next uploaded and also when I am planning to go live. I hope that you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.